Uh, so, as Captain Harry said, I am Ben Ortiz. Uh, a lot of people uh, recently have uh, gotten onto this slow pitch bandwagon, um, even though we've been doing it for a while here, but it's finally starting to catch on and starting to get a little bit more recognized, which is cool. Um, usually, the way that I, I do these seminars, I've done, this is I think the sixth one that I've done. I've done from you know, South Florida all the way up to New Jersey. I'm trying to get the word out and just get some information of people. Is I start off a little bit about me, I go to the tackle, I talk about the rods, the reels, the line, the connections, the jigs, and at the end we talk about uh, some technique for you guys as far as like how this is actually going to work when you're on the water. Um, so first about me, uh, so I'm uh, I started fishing a long time ago. You know, when I was a kid, but I was primarily a bait fisherman, uh, bottom fisherman. Uh, I, I wasn't really into the trolling stuff. I never really got into the spike stuff. I've done plenty of it, but it's just not my thing in general. Um, but after bait fishing for a while, learning how to hold bottom with the sinker, you know, fish from a drifting boat, fish from an anchor boat, all that stuff, it kind of got a little old. Uh, so about seven years or so ago, I saw that there was this new thing called butterfly jigging, which was Shimano's uh, kind of marketing idea for for, uh, for speed jigging. And if anybody has done speed jigging, you understand that the appropriate speed for doing it is just about short of stroking out while you're on the boat. So it's just really, really taxing. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but I haven't missed too many meals and it's just not working for me. So um, after, after a couple of years of, of doing that, going on trips and, and speed jigging, you know, we, we realized a couple of things. Number one, we were missing the fish that we really, we really wanted to catch. You know, snappers, groupers, the, the demersal fish that are on the bottom that are delicious. Um, a lot of the fish that we were catching was your faster swimming predatory fish, your amberjacks, your kingfish, bonita, the occasional tuna thrown in there. But it wasn't as productive and it was just super taxing on the angler. So we looked around for some other options and what we were able to find was that there was this new thing in Asia called uh, micro jigging, this is you know, about six years ago, five years ago, or, or slow jigging, it really, um, it hadn't really developed fully, but they were kind of on their way. So we said, hey, maybe, maybe we should try that. Um, now, the issue with that was, and it still is to a certain extent, there's not a whole lot of um, information in English, right? So when you go there, you see a lot of stuff in Japanese. Uh, you see a lot of stuff in the various Southeast Asian languages. Uh, if you don't speak them, it's very difficult, and let me tell you, Google Translate is not a big help. So um, it wound up becoming a very expensive game of trial error. So over the past six years or so, uh, I've fished essentially every type of rod, every type of reel, um, every possible jig you can imagine, and dialing in what works for our particular fishery here. So let's talk about what slow pitch jigging is in general. The idea of it is you are using these little metal lures to trick the fish into biting them. Um, it started uh, by a guy named Norito Sato in Japan. Um, he started probably about 15, 20 years ago by getting this technique and dialing it in. Um, anybody who knows anything about Japanese culture understands that a lot of things are very overthought to the point where you know they're they're thinking like you know how small the, the, the real seat has to be for your fingers to be just perfect. I mean, everything is, is completely dialed in. Um, the issues with, with taking what they were using in Japan and applying it to our fishery was that in Japan, uh, the fishery is generally deep water. Okay? You're generally not fishing over structure. And generally speaking, the fish aren't as big and angry as they are here. I mean, sure there are big amber jacks, and they have you know, the yellowtail type of, of jacks that we have here. But it's it's different. They're fishing, you know, very deep water. When I said deep water, I'm talking, you know, 900, 1500, 2000 feet in the water. Okay, they're fishing very deep. Um, the reason why the slow pitch jigging was developed was because the commercial fisheries over there had really speed the hell out of their stocks and needed something else that was going to be effective um, for for their fishery. So once we figured out what they were using over there and we said, hey, let's try what they're using, because they seem to be pretty dialed in, we realized quickly that we were getting our butts handed to us um, over wrecks and reefs. So how did we kind of accommodate our fishery? We really it was just a lot of testing. Okay, so we tested lines, we tested meters, we tested them for breaking strength, we tested everything so that we, we would be right on that, that technological cusp of as thin and light as possible, 
but as strong as possible for what we'd be facing over here. And we've kind of, I think right now we've got it pretty dialed in uh, for our particular fishery. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea of the types of depths that I've fished uh, this type of technique, um, I've fished everywhere from 50 feet of water to 1,500 feet of water, okay, so and, and everything in between. Um, what I find personally is that slow pitch jigging tends to work better, and this is, you're going to hear a lot of this bro science kind of thing, and that's just from my experience being on the water. Generally speaking, it works better over 150 feet of water. I don't know why that is, um, it just tends to work better in that depth. Um, on the west coast, you can get away with a little bit shallower water because you have the rivers and things like that, and you're about 100 feet. But you're still making a hell of a run to, to get out there. Um, as far as like species caught right now, I'm at about, and I do keep track, I'm at 73 different species of fish that I've caught on it. Um, every type of grouper you can imagine. Um, the, you know, up to a sailfish, you know, down to a little tiny top thing. You know, everything that swims hits a jig. Uh, there's only a couple of fish that I, I, I still want that I haven't caught. Uh, barrel fish um, and a, a yellow fish. Or the fire bat, I, but pretty much everything else, uh, I've been fortunate enough to catch. Um, really, a lot of a lot of this is going to be. I'm going to get the information to you today, but a lot of what you're learning is going to be sea time. Really, it's, it just takes time on the water to learn the technique, to get comfortable with it, to learn the limitations of your tackle, uh, what it can and can't do, and if, as long as you work within those limitations, it's a really deadly technique. It's, it's very good. So. Uh, let's start off. Um, first things first, I did bring a prototype rod for you guys, um, which is right here. Uh, you can see this is the Barbie prototype, um, but I mean, obviously not, but I, you get a lot of shit from people when you roll up to a boat with one of these rods. Um, particularly if you're going to be going down to the Tortugas and you roll up with one of these and they say, well, what are you going to do with that? I mean, this whole setup weighs under, I think it's about two pounds, right? Um, the thing is, usually the way that it works, uh, in my experience, the first thing is they make fun of the rods. The second thing is they say, well, why do you have so many hooks on those jigs? And then the third thing is after the trip is done, they say, where can I buy that gear that you're at on the hook? So um, let's talk about the rods first. So this here is a Temple Reef Levitate. Uh, this is the 682 model. As you can see, my jig is pretty, pretty whippy on the, on the tip. Uh, not a lot of backbone on it. So, um, first things first, this rod is designed to do one thing and one thing only. It's designed to impart an action on the jig. This is not designed to fight the fish, okay? This is not designed to, you know, lift and pump like this. It's not. We're going to go through the fighting technique in a little bit, but that's what this thing is designed to do, just to move the jig in the water. Once it, you actually hook up, um, I'll go through the, the, the fight in a little bit. So, general characteristics for a slow pitch jigging rod is it's going to be usually uh, between about six foot three and about six foot ten. Okay, um, these rods here are all six foot eight. The reason why we went with a six foot eight length, the hybrid length, is that it allows you to do multiple techniques. When you have a shorter rod, you're a little bit prohibited in what we call a long fall. So that's when you have the jig way up in, in, the, in the water and it falls down. Uh, a long, a long way. Um, also, if you're ever in a canopy boat where you know, you've got a top on it, uh, you can have a pretty good range of motion with the, the longer rod. Uh, I personally prefer a little bit longer rod uh, for, for fishing. I think it gives you a little bit more versatility. Start the butt end. So, you notice that this is a long exposed piece of line, all right? And this is all going back to the central theme of this is designed for sensitivity and to put the action on the jig. So, the reason why we have this long exposed plank here is because the rod, when you fish it, is going to be against your forearm while you're jigging. So, you have absolutely the best sensitivity possible. The second that something hits you, are going to feel it on there, okay? Um, for purposes of putting it in a rod holder, I usually use a little needle cream cocoon on here just so it doesn't bang around in a rod holder. <coughs> um, this little butt end, this knob here, um, it's, it's actually a functional piece. The reason why is because once you do get hooked up and stand sideways, the rod is going to shift from under here to under your armpit for the fight. By having that little knob on there, the rod can't pull out, it's stuck into your armpit. So that's why you have that there. Uh, you're going to notice that the real seat uh, is just very small, no foregrip on it. Okay, so going back to that idea in the beginning, 
you're not lifting and pumping this rod. You're not holding it and doing this like you did when you were fishing. One of the first things that you need to do if you decide to get into this technique is break the old habits. You're not snapper fishing, guys. You don't need to get it off the ground like that. It doesn't happen. Um, the, the smaller foot basically just accommodates your hand um, and keeps it as light as possible. Um, what you're going to notice, though, is that these guides, I don't know if you can see them, they're so small, uh, they're micro guides on there. So the functional part of this is that it keeps the line very close to the blank, again, back to the sensitivity. Um, but you're also going to notice that they spiral, so um, spiral down this way, and they end up how a spinning set would be on the bottom over here. So the functional reason for that is two reasons. The first reason is because if you have a big fish on, and you're cranking down your right hand angler, um, it will actually level out the rod so you, can, you don't have to worry about um, bending and getting it off, uh, off the spine of the body. You can actually level it out. The second reason is because when you jig, sometimes that line goes slack. Sometimes it catches the top right here. Okay? But having the guides underneath, the, the line will slide off. You won't get fouled up quite as much, uh, and it'll, it'll just be a more pleasant experience. If you have the, the guides on top, they weren't designed in a specific way. They can catch on that guide, and if you hooked up when, when you're caught, you're gonna have a bad time. So, um, these rods are actually two-piece rods. They join right here. Um, sometimes people you know, will see the spiral, like, is that two pieces? Is it, is it you know, put in right? Yes, it's put in right, that's, that's the design for it. Now, the important thing with these small guides, though, is that you need to learn a very small connection between your braid and your leader, right? So that leaves basically two options. You can either do an FG knot or you can do a PR knot. Uh, I'll, I can show you, let me uh, actually pass around. This is a clip uh, of uh, a PR knot. So this is the knot that I personally use for my, uh, my line, my main line to my leader. Um, we're gonna go through the line in a little bit once we get to the reel, so um, I'll just pass this around. You guys can see how small this is. It's the good thing about these knots is that they're extraordinarily high break percent. Um, PR knot, if properly tied, it's almost 100%. It's like 99 point, you know, something percent. So it's it's quite a, quite a strong knot, and it passes for the guys pretty seamlessly. Um, so once you once you learn it, and it does take a little bit of time to learn, as with anything, um, it, it's really a, a great tool for you guys. So got the rod, got the guys. Um, just in general. Uh, these are usually very high carbon blanks, they're very elastic blanks, meaning that um, they're, they're, the main thing is going to be the recoil of the rod. Okay, so once this thing loads up with the jig, I can kind of show you here. Bear with me for one second. By the way, these split ring pliers, I'll talk about them in a little bit. There would be lifesaver for you for changing the stuff out. But you can see is see how the rod loads up and strengths back. Okay, it's a, it's a, it, obviously it's a little faster than if you're on the water. But that action right there is what this rod is going to do. The distinguishing factor between a high quality slow pitch rod and an average one is going to be the amount of recoil that you get in a deeper one. Okay? So you can get away with usually the lower model ones if you're fishing in shallow water. If you're out in deep water, it's just not gonna, not gonna work. That recoil is what's gonna power the jig through the water and allow it to fall. If you have a rod that just loads up and doesn't fully unload, all the jig is doing is just going straight up the water. It's just not Okay, so there is a reason why some of these things are a bit more expensive. And again, um, you know, because of the trial and error that I've done with all this stuff, even though I do fish on the Temple Reef Pro Team and Accurate Team, if you guys have any questions about other gear, um, feel free to ask them when, when we're done. Um, I'm happy to give you my opinion on them. I can tell you why before I was on these guys' pro teams, uh, I chose to purchase all this stuff. Uh, I, I did. Uh, and why I thought it was the best for our fishers. So, we got the rod. Let's talk about the reel. So this reel, um, this guy, this is uh, one of the Valiant 300s, it's pretty tiny. Um, puts out about 26 pounds of drag, which is significant. Um, but you know, when people see these, these little tiny reels that you're using, 
or in this case, the Valiant 500 Narrow, still a very small reel, uh, allows you to palm it well. Uh, you're, you're able to uh, control the rod very easily. It's very light. It's something you can fish all day long. Uh, the general specs for a reel that you're looking for with slow pitch jig, you're looking for a couple of things. Generally, you have a fairly fast retrieve, right? And the retrieve isn't necessarily the gear ratio. A lot of folks are like, What's the gear ratio? You know, I need five to one. It's not the gear ratio that really matters. What, what matters is the inches per crank. All right, so you're looking for something that's going to be between 38 and let's say 45 inches per crank, give or take. Um, that the reason why you need that high speed is to get slack out of your line once once your jig hits the bottom. Okay, once you're on the bottom, you can quickly get the slack out, especially if you're fishing in deep water. You know, sometimes you'll have some scope uh, in your line and got to get it out quick and that's what um, A lot of people ask, do you need a two-speed reel for this? You know, if you're using such light tackle, would a two-speed help get bigger fish off the bottom? Possibly. I don't use two speeds because my philosophy on it is the less pieces to break, the better. So I don't like having a level wind. I don't like having a two-speed reel. I haven't run into a situation yet where I thought to myself, man, I really need that two-speed right now. It just, it, you're more than fine with, with the, uh, the existing um, speed of the reel and ratio. Uh, as far as the handles go, uh, I know a couple of you guys have come before and you've seen the handles on these reels and noticed that they were longer than a standard handle. Um, Accurate does make uh, a longer handle for all their reels. Uh, if you call into them, they can get you hooked up with uh, a longer handle, the uh, extreme long arm handle. The reason why I like the long handle is because it allows you to get better leverage on fish in deeper water. Everything that you're doing, once you actually are hooked up with the fish, is going to be off of the reel. Okay? So that's why it's super important to have really smooth drag. Uh, the reel is going to put out a good amount of drag, okay? Um, because you're, you're essentially going to be in a tug of war with the fish, right? Anyone who's, who's fished before always wants to use the rod as a tool to fight the fish. Generally speaking, once that fish is off the bottom, don't need that the, the rod anymore. In fact, there's no mechanical advantage for having a rod. Think of it this way: if I had a 50-pound weight in my hand, right, would I be better off walking someplace with it at my side like this, or holding it out at an angle like that? Right? It's the same principle with the rod. If would it be better to have a fish off a rod like that, or where it's putting down pressure that way, or would it be better to be straight up and down with that fish? Put in, put in pressure on it, just slowly crank. It's, it's a significantly more efficient fight. When you do that, I've landed bigger fish more quickly by using that technique. Even if I do fish bait, which is almost never now, uh, I simply I'll use that, that technique when, when I'm uh, fishing bait and keep the rod down and just kind of use the real crank and try to take the rod out of the equation as much as possible. Now, all of that being said, there is going to be that violent part of the fight at the beginning where you're going to have to put some heat on the fish in order to keep them from the edge of the rocks. Okay? Um, when you're fishing in places like Tortugas or Pulley Ridge, you've got a little bit more leeway, because usually you're not over a wreck. Um, a lot of times you're not even over a reef, you're just you know, over barren territory. Um, but if you are over those, situ uh, those types of areas where you need to keep them out of there, uh, you can put a bit of heat on the rocks. What's important, though, is that you never bring the rod past or parallel with the water line, okay? So you don't want to lift up, you can put it up a little bit, but you do not want to high stick. You high stick these rods, you two piece rods, then start to a three piece rods with quickness, okay? So just don't do it, it's going to be a bad time for everybody. Um, again, the reason why you don't need to do that, how far is this? How far do you think? From here to here, how far is that? Three feet, maybe, okay? We just talked about how much the retrieve is on, on the reels, right? One crank is going to be three feet. So what's more efficient? One crank or trying to lift up this way? It's the same distance that it's happening. So if you're like keeping it down the water and cranking steady, um, you're, you're going to have a much better time uh, landing the fish. It's going to be a more efficient fight in my opinion. Um, so let's talk about the, the drag on these. these. This one puts out 26. This one puts out about 30 pounds of drag, which is way more than you could probably ever need. Okay? Um, the drag on these is very smooth, um, and you also notice that these are lever drag reels. Uh, personally, I prefer lever drag reels, uh, and the reason why I like the accurate lever, lever drag and why I went to them before I was on their team uh, is because it's a full tuna drag system. 
Okay? So the second that you engage this, this lever, you already have pressure on this pool, you already have drag. So you can feel it click, 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 and you can back down and put more drag as needed um, during the fight, and it's a very precise system to do so. A lot of other lever drag reels, if you back it off the strike, some of you may have experienced this, uh, you almost go into free school. And, and it's really, really tough to, to try to use your thumb. And, uh, you know, but you also don't want to pop the fish off by having too much drag. A lot of times your drag is set fairly high uh, when, when you are still fish jigging, uh, just because, again, that initial fight, it is so important to win that first five or 10 seconds. Um, but once once the fish is on, it's smooth. Just keep cranking. Fish is pulling drag, cool. Keep cranking if you can. The second it stops, you're already in the line on. Um, it's a very, very efficient fight. Eric saw it the other day. It's, it's kind of unlike anything you've seen before, um, but, it, but it, it does work. Uh, you can get up some pretty decent fish. Uh, uh, so back to the handle just real quick. Uh, I prefer a handle that's about, uh, you just measure it because most of the stuff comes from Asia, but it's, it's usually about 95 to 100 millimeters from the center here to the center of the handle. Uh, that, that's just my personal preference.
So these reels only put out a maximum of 30 pounds of drag. It's not going to break in a straight pull. The, the, the uh, knot that I showed you guys holds that 100%, so you don't have to worry about that to break it either. Okay? The thin line allows you, that from keeping vertical, to cut through that water faster than it used to. So it's a more, it's, it's a more streamlined way to get out of the box. Okay. Um, the leader I just mentioned is a 50-pound uh, fluorocarbon leader, any kind of fluorocarbon uh, works. I like fluorocarbon because it's a little stiffer than mono. Uh, it holds, in my opinion, the knot better a little bit. Uh, we do that the PR knot just because it's stiffer. Uh, it gives a little bit of a break in resistance. Uh, in terms of length of leader that I use, I use a very scientific four wingspans to start. Uh, that will give you uh, enough to kind of retie a couple times Okay, so you see here, I don't know if you can, but this is my terminal connection. So I've got my fluorocarbon leader on here, and I tie it to a ball bearing swivel. All right, the ball bearing swivel, there's two schools of thought on how you should tie up. One is to have a solid ring. The other is to use the ball bearing swivel. I prefer the ball bearing swivel. The reason why I prefer the ball bearing swivel is because if you have a big fish on, and his mouth is open, and he's coming up, and he's spinning. You can spin freely on this thing all day long. You're not going to get a whole hell of a lot of line twists on there. So just in my experience with it, it seems to be a smoother way of getting the fish up. The important thing, though, is that you're using, whether you have a solid ring on there or the ball bearing swivel, you're using split rings in between your hooks. Okay? Now, I showed you before, <coughs> these are split ring pliers. These things are lifesavers. A lot of people ask me, do I tie straight to the jig? No. Never, ever, ever tie straight to the jig. You always want to have that intermediary connection in there. So, whenever I rig up, let me, I should do this with one of the bottom or something. So usually what happens, I'll have hooks on the bottom of my jigs ready to go, I'll have a couple of them because I'm just ready, and then I'll change out the top hooks so that way I don't have to retie constantly, and it's just a very easy way to get your jig on it. You notice I did one thing. The hooks are on the flat side of the jig, okay? The reason why it's on the flat side is because as the jig falls, it's going to be usually falling towards the heavier side of the jig. These are going to stay up and out of the way of your line, so it's not going to tie up your line quite as much. Also important, these hooks, never cross in the middle. See that? I have my hooks to be about a third of the length on top, about two thirds of the length on the bottom, give or take, and they never, ever, ever cross in the middle. The reason why they don't cross in the middle is because you don't want these things to foul up. They foul up. It feels like you caught a really small fish, and if you're in 400 feet of water, there's nothing worse than reeling up and realizing, oh, it's just operator error, right? If you are jigging and you notice that your hooks, or your back hooks are catching your leader a lot, that means you're going too fast. Okay. Slow down. The whole idea of this is a very slow, methodical presentation. If you go quickly and you're just reeling like this, these jigs are bouncing around, these hooks are flying around, they're going to catch your leader, um, they're going to they're going to foul you up, and it's going to be a problem. Also to the hooks that I use, you notice, I don't know if you can see it because they're so tiny, but when you come up here you can all see. Uh, I use outward facing bars on my hooks. Uh, these are Gamagatsu 510 hooks. I don't like the inner bar if at all possible because let's say they do hook onto your leader, there's nothing that stops it from sliding off. Okay? So if you have a lot less foul ups on your, on your jig if you don't have bars on the inside. I realize that that's not something that happens on, or that, that's available on all hooks. Um, it's just my personal preference after doing it for quite a while. Um, I make all my own hooks, but there are a lot of really great options that are pre-made. Uh, they actually have quite a few out here, uh, which, which makes it a lot easier. Uh, but I just prefer to make my own because uh, I, I tinker with the lengths depending on the Okay. Um, and let's say I want to switch it out as get my split ring pliers. And two seconds, you're off. You're switching your jig and you're back. Okay. So the, the split ring pliers really, really help you out. So you get a lot of questions from people, do you 
really need four hooks. Why do you have four hooks on there? The reason why you have four hooks is because you see they're small hooks, and these are only three out hooks. So uh, if anyone has been on my Instagram page, they can see that you know, I've caught some pretty decent fish with these tiny little three out hooks, uh, including in a recent trip where I caught close to a 60 pound and aimed hammer jack on them. The reason why it works with these small hooks is because it dissipates the pressure into all four hooks as opposed to one hook taking the front of it. Okay? Um, usually what will happen is these things will, fish will hit, they'll hit the top, the bottom, they'll get this in the mouth, and then the jig will swing around as it turns and it'll kind of snag it. And that's this is purposeful. Okay? So um, you're not necessarily, this isn't the best protection on these, I'm just throwing that out there. Okay. Um, you've got a lot of hooks flying around, and, and it's designed specifically to snag the fish with these tinier hooks. When you're in deeper water, um, you see the picture of me with the queen snapper uh, that I caught recently. Um, I'll use these hooks. These are uh, Gamagatsu 9 actually 8 hooks. Big single hooks in deeper water. This is a 550 gram jig that I caught it on. Uh, we were in about 750 when I caught that 17. Um, I like using the bigger hooks because sometimes you get into an area where there's a bunch of rosies and those little guys will go after jigs all day long. And if you have a bigger hook, sometimes you can avoid getting your little mounts in them. Although they do have a tendency to put themselves on them, almost anything. But I do prefer the bigger hook uh, for, for deeper water fishing, uh, single hooks top and bottom. Same thing happens, you know, same thing happens with the, uh, the hook, but it's a bigger gauge, bigger fish. But it works out a little bit better. Um, the knot that I use for tying onto the swivel, I just use a Palomar knot. Uh, it works for me, it's quick to tie. You can use whatever knot you want, fish or not, it doesn't matter. Um, it's going to get the job done. Whatever, whatever one you're comfortable with, I like the Palomar because it doubles up the line and it's, it's a very strong knot. Uh, it doesn't fail too often, almost never. Uh, never on fish. And you can break it off the bottom if you have to get hooked up the bottom. So let's talk about jigs for a second. So you can see these jigs are here. So I've got this one here. This is an NLO fast drop jig. This is 350 grams. Okay? Much different shape than this one. This is a Sea Falcon. This is a 280 gram Z Slow. Much different shape from, uh, let's say, this one over here, which is, looks, you know, this is a Sea Falcon Control Rector. Um, What's the importance of the shapes of the jigs, uh, the weights of the jigs, uh, are they important at all? So for most people when they first start this type of fishing, it's the, they see the prices of these jigs and they get shy away from really quickly. If you're looking at high-end Japanese jigs, these things are north of $40 a lot of times each. Um, you're shipping lead from Japan, so the shipping cost goes by weight. Um, I can't tell you how much money, and unfortunately on my video, it will not tell you, so I know my wife is probably going to watch. It's long, okay? Um, I get that. And when people are starting out, the, the thing that I usually tell people is you don't know what you don't know. What to do, right? So what you should do is you should learn with a reasonably priced tool if possible. Um, not necessarily on the rods, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a second, but on the, on the jigs because um, a lot of times you're you're going to get cut off by kingfish. You're going to get cut off by barracudas. You know, drop a thirty dollar jig, you're going to get pissed off when that happens. Um, I usually recommend getting like a, a hammer diamond jig, be gold, silver. You can get them right here from Captain Harry's. Um, they're they're a lower price option, and it's kind of like the uh, you know Toyota Camry of jigs. It's going to work. You know, it's just old reliable. It catches fish. You're going to learn action of the rods, you're going to learn all that stuff by using these types of jigs. Once you get more advanced, you're going to realize, oh wait, there's a reason why these jigs are shaped the way they are. Different jigs are going to be used in different conditions. Okay? In my opinion, the thing that's going to separate someone who's going to catch a lot of fish on jigs versus someone right next to them using whatever type of they choose to use is going to be your jig selection. Okay? Captain Harry's has a really good selection right now of jigs. Um, which uh, I, I can talk to you guys about them specifically later on, but different jigs are going to be used in different conditions. For instance, if I'm in 700 feet of water, 
I'm going to use something like this that I know is going to get to the bottom super, super quick. Okay? Even though this thing falls to the bottom super fast, once you take the pressure off the spool, this thing still gets, gets pours out of the water and flutters great. Okay? All the hydrodynamic properties of these, of these jigs have been researched pretty thoroughly. Um, and you're going to have different types of action. This one, for instance, has a back sliding action. This one has a fallen leaf action, like this. So I'm going to use this on a day when I have a, like almost no current, right? low current, no current day, if I'm fishing from a different boat. If I'm fishing from a different boat and got some current, I'll use something like this, which is a seafloor control arc, which is going to cut through the water a lot faster. But going back to that thing that I told you in the beginning, you don't want to stay work, right? So depending on your conditions, you're going to switch your jigs out. When I was fishing with Larry the other day, you probably noticed in the beginning, I was switching jigs almost every dry. And the reason why I was switching the jigs was I was, I was figuring out what was happening in the water that day. Okay? When we were fishing, top was the last top. There was almost no wind at all. But what we noticed when we got out to deeper water was that there was a two-layer current. Okay? So the top wasn't moving at all. The bottom was ripping to the south. So even though you got past that first spot, you're, you're going down, you're going down, you're going down, you're actually going to hit bottom by now. But no, your jig is zooming off to, to, to the side. So I realized that I switched my jig to a different type of jig, something like this, that's when I booked it for the snowman. Okay? Um, he didn't tell me that. Well, I <laughs> took all my line out and ran out the line out. Now he's torturing me is what he did. You can't let out all the secrets. Okay? Oh. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta keep it going. Right? Yeah. So yeah. once we got the shallower water, I pulled out this guy. This is the NLO angle jig, which they have out front, because I realized we weren't dealing with a two layer current. This thing does stay vertical pretty good, but we realized that they were keyed in on this one is a pinfish pattern. Pinfish or cigar minnow type fish is what these things are keyed in on. Dropped it down, I got the gang that was in the video for today's, uh, today's seminar. So it, there's a certain amount of match to hatch, there's a certain amount of match to proportion. <coughs> I will say that, just in general, again, for a size, but the color of the jig doesn't really matter that much. Um, if anything, I've noticed here that jigs that are like green or blue, not as much, uh, that I had quite as much success on those, uh, but I still caught fish on them. In general, gold, silver, um, something that actually looks exactly like a fish gets a lot of the fits, um, but also uh, it's sort of UV light for whatever reason. So if something glows or reflects UV light, for instance, I always, I always travel with one of these guys, it's a UV flashlight, okay? So it helps charge up the glow really well, but you can see how that orange glows in UV light, right? Even though it's not a glow, that's not the glow section, it, it really lights up. For whatever reason, fish hit that particular color a lot when it, when it glows in the UV light or reflects UV light well. Um, I would imagine the reason why is because they probably, they mean fish uh, see light in a different spectrum than we do. You probably, particularly deep going fish, um, your visible light spectrum varies greatly as you go down. So what we see up here is what the fish are seeing down there. First thing they're losing is reds, right? And then as you go down, it goes all the way down to, I think, uh, like yellow and, and white were like the last ones to go. But once you're beyond the visible light spectrum down there, these fish are really just using their lateral lines, feeling that vibration of the water and attacking that way. Or potentially seeing something that is glowing with UV or reflecting UV that doesn't penetrate the water quite a bit deeper. Um, that's just been my experience with it. Taking for what it's worth, it seems to be working for me. So, um, the weights of jigs. Uh, we have in front of us here jigs from 200 grams to 550 grams and everything in between. Whenever I go out, Eric can, can vouch for that. Um, I, I usually am well equipped with a lot of jigs uh, of different weights for the conditions that you're going to be in. Some days you're going to be able to get away with using a very light jig in very deep water. Sometimes you're going to have to use quite a heavy jig in shallower water. So, you know, don't be scared to use a 300 gram jig if you're in 150 feet of water that keeps you straight up and down. The fish don't care. I've had you know, little tiny fish that are this big get a jig that's bigger than it. It's the action of the jig that's going to entice the strike. So what are, what are they doing when they're down there and they see it? It's a reaction strike. You know, there's three ways that fish primarily feed. They have the hunger bite, right? They're super hungry. 
turn on, they see a dead bait, they go get it. There's a live bait that looks wounded, it's swimming, they're like, all right, I'm gonna go kill that bait. Or it's a reaction strike where they see something that is mimicking a, a dying or wounded fish in the water, right? And they go after it. It's the same way as if you're walking a dog and the dog sees a squirrel going across the street, he doesn't want to kill the squirrel, it's a family pet. But he sees it and that instant kicks in and he wants to go get it, he chases it. And that's what happens with these fish. You know, they're, they're going after something that they think is an easy meal. Um, so the better you can, you can mimic that action, uh, the more strikes that you are going to get. So we've gone through everything with the rubber and the rods, the reels, the line, the terminal connection, the jigs themselves. Let's talk a little bit uh, about technique. So as I mentioned before, uh, you, know, you have that rod under your forearm when you're jigging. This serves an important function, and it's a mechanical advantage function. Um, when, you, when you're jigging, you, if you, by, just by putting a little bit of pressure with your forearm on the butt end of this rod, it's going to load up the tip of the rod with the jig once there's weight on it. Okay? The recoil of the rod that we talked about having a really high quality rod, it's going to spring the jig up in the water, and then as it springs up, it's going to flutter down. Okay? So you, can, you want to vary your pitches, when you say pitch, the pitch is one turn of the handle, okay, so pitch, one pitch. You vary your handle turns with how you, ever, how you want to do to move in the water. And you can do it however you want to. Um, you know, as you, as you learn more and as you, you know, get better at it, the technique, it does take some time to learn. It's very unnatural at first. But as you get better at the technique, you learn that you can do uh, maybe three kind of quick one one long fall or you know, keep it real close to the box by little tiny cranks like this. You can play with it, you can do anything that you want. That's one of the beauty parts about this and the creativity that you can use um, and match it to the conditions of that particular game. Um, also, by having the, uh, the rod under your forearm, you have a much greater range of motion. Okay? So if a lot of people, when they speed jig, the rod's under here and they're you know, ripping through the water and all like this. By having it under your arm, uh, you have a much broader range from here all the way down as opposed to just here, right? So um, it's, it's just a more free way to, to do it. I highly recommend that you take the time to learn this. It's very, very awkward at first. Your hand is kind of cockeyed on the sideways on this. It just it doesn't feel natural and, and it, it takes a lot of habit breaking to do. Once you do it, it is much, much, much more efficient. And it's a better way to do it. And I, I went through the same learning process that everybody else does, getting away from those eight habits that you had your whole life. Um, again, you want to focus on the fall of the jig, right? You're not focused on the retrieve of the jig, you focus on the fall of the jig. The fall is when that jig then sideways in the water, it starts to flutter, and that causes the strikes. So the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to reel down after you just pitch the jig up in the water. You're going to take the slack out of the line, it's not going to do what it's supposed to do in the water. So if you go up, follow that line down. Once you feel that uh, the weight go back onto the chain again, then you know it's time to go for your next pitch. Work on it like that. And you can play with it uh, as you like. Uh, constantly checking bottoms is something I mentioned when we talked about whether or not you're going to use spinning tackle or conventional tackle. You're constantly checking the bottom. If you're looking for a fish that lives on the bottom, where should you fish for them? On the bottom. Crazy, right? So you want to keep your jig within maybe 15, 20 feet of the bottom. That's it. Drop it back down. You'd be surprised at the amount of fish that you catch in the bottom part of the water column in places where you didn't think they lived regularly. Okay? If I could tell you how many blackfin tuna I caught on the bottom in 600 feet of water, you'd be shocked. Okay? You would think, oh, I got a patrol for them. I got to fly pikes. Well, in the middle of the day, they fall a squid down to the bottom and they're eating down there. Those things hit jigs on the bottom. It's very weird, but they do. I caught sailfish on the bottom, um, you know, or sometimes you catch a mud halfway up. It's it's very, very weird. Um, you, know, you, you learn these fish are in different areas of the water column that you may not have, uh, have thought of them there before. Uh, but if you are focusing for those commercial fish on the bottom, keep your jig on the bottom. Knowing that each turn of the handle is about, let's call it three feet, right? <coughs> if I go up one, two, three, four, all right, now I know I'm about 12 feet off the bottom, I got a little bit more I can go, but you, um, you're you always counting those turns. You know exactly where that, water, that jig is in the water. You know that if I go to a place 
sounder says that the fish are eight feet off the bottom. Well, I hit the bottom. One, two. It should be right in front of the fish's face at that point. And that's when you start working um, on the bait. Um, very important <coughs> is, and I touched on this briefly, is learning the limitations of your path. Okay? There's nothing more important with this than learning what the limitations of, the, of that, these rods can do. Again, they're not designed to fight the fish, they're not designed to put a whole lot of heat on. Can be due to a certain extent, yes. Um, but you're not primarily using it as a tool to fight the fish, you're using your reel to do so. Um, but learning that line, that disaster versus okay line, uh, you're going to be able to land bigger fish and you won't be scared uh, to be out there thinking that you're underdone. Uh, and that just comes with fishing. You know, you're just going to be able to, the more you fish the path, the more you're going to learn exactly where that line is. Uh, generally speaking, you know, as long as you're not taking this rod up past the horizon, like I said, um, you have very, very few failure rates on, the, on these things. It's very high quality to where uh, in the rod, so they're very strong for what they are, but they're not invincible. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, we talked about the, using the reel to fight the fish. Uh, again, once you do hook up, you're, you're keeping your rod essentially at a, a 45 degree angle or even further down, depending on if the fish is swimming straight down. Uh, and you're just cranking, you know, just very slow, steady crank on your reel uh, just to get the fish up smoothly, efficiently. And if he's, he's bumping on you, cool, let him do it. You have all the time in the world. Time's on your side, right? That's one thing you have to realize. There's no need to really force the fish up off the bottom unless you're in a place where sharks are just everywhere. In that case, I would suggest moving. Uh, but if, if you're reeling the fish up, a slow, steady retrieve on it, it's more of a gentle guide of the fish in as opposed to you know, winching or forcing the fish up off the bottom as much as possible. Uh, so I've pretty much gone through everything uh, as far as the tackle goes, the technique goes, that is going to give you a baseline for, for this type of fishing. So I'll open up the floor to questions from you guys. Uh, anything that you want to ask, I'm happy to help answer.